Hi, everybody, and welcome to this session of the ADIM's um, Making Your ERAS Program List. My name is Harsha Sule. I am the Program Director at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and I would like to welcome you to this session. Over the next hour, we have a great panel of um, speakers with various affiliations to medical schools, universities around the country, but also with varying roles within GME and UME to advise you as to what goes into making that initial program list as well. Since we are going to be on a tight timeline, I am going to ask you to put all of your questions into the chat. One of us will be monitoring the chat, and at the end of the session, we will go through questions as best as we can as well. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first set of speakers, and for the rest of the speakers, they will introduce themselves as we go along as well. Um, if there are any technical issues or anything else, please enter them into the chat as well. SEM staff is monitoring it so they can assist you with this as well. So, first of all, we have no financial disclosures between us. And the one caveat that we'd like to put out there is that what you're hearing is all of our opinions in some ways. We are trying to steer you towards the middle or the average, if you might, of where opinions are on this matter. But at the same time, know that everything should be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. There may be people who advise you slightly differently from this as well. So hopefully what you get here is a little bit of the middle of the road for you. First up, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Kellogg, over to you. Hi, so uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff to cover in what is a short amount of time. We wanna make sure we leave you lots of room for questions. So the first thing we're gonna get into is we're gonna talk about the data behind this. And there's three sort of big numbers that are important to know. You'll see lots and lots of numbers out there, but the three big numbers to know are how many programs you need to rank, which means how many interviews you need to do, what to do with step one score numbers, and then the number of applications to submit. The answer to these are varying levels of complicated, but we're going to get into them really quick for an overview and then leave time to make sure there's time for questions at the end. Can I have the next slide? So what this slide just shows is it gives you a sense that step one really is an overrated criteria. You'll see lots of things about it. AAMC will tell you and sort of show you that there's cutoffs and how many applications you need to submit based upon step one, but that's not particularly helpful information. What you see here is that the average score is between 230 and 240 for everybody, whether they match or not. Um, but they're, what you see here, these are applicants all who had 11 plus uh, interviews, 11 plus programs on their rank list, which is that, you know, write down 11 to 12 is that magic number that ensures matching. Um, but you'll see that little red dot at the bottom there. That's an unmatched applicant and it doesn't change at the score. Scores don't guarantee anything. What really what we're gonna see, and I'll show you a couple more slides, is you'll see that it's all about the number of interviews that you do to determine how secure you can be in your rank list. Can I have the next slide? So this is um, showing you the, app, the match rate at 11 plus, 11 to 12, that magic number of ranked programs. And you'll see that unless you are below 200, that gets you down to 90% you know, chance of matching. And anything higher than that, regardless of step score, you're going to match. Kind of the next one. So at five to 10, now getting into where people start to get real nervous about not having enough interviews, um, you see that it's, can you go back a couple harsh? Uh, that next one, there we go, thank you. At five to 10, it's still 90%. And it really doesn't change. Your scores go up, up, up. It doesn't really change that number. Can we get the next one? Even when you get to three to five, the scores are not predictive. It all comes down to how many programs you rank, how many programs you interview at, and that 50%, regardless of whether you have a 240 or you have a 200, it's about the same. It really comes down to how many programs you apply to. The step one is, over, is an overrated piece of this. Can I get the next one? And then for those uh, osteopathic applicants who are only taking Comlex, just want to show the same pattern holds. Those were all comers who took step scores uh, in the first graphs. And this one shows it's the same trend. It all comes down to how many programs you, you apply to. And same goes for regardless of your application status is, whether you're, you know, what kind of independent applicant you may be. It all comes down to 
um, how many interviews you get to do. And so that's where the real goal comes from. And our goal today is to help you figure out how to get that 11 or 12 magic number of interviews. Can we have the next one? And then Nate Lewis is now gonna take over from here. Thanks, Adam. So um, I think naturally, of course, the next question is, well, how do I uh, achieve that adequate number of interviews that uh, we were just talking about? Is there some sort of a calculation uh, that I can do that tells me how many applications I should submit? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, there is some data for guidance that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and no, of course, because everybody's strengths and weaknesses are, of course, you know, going to be different. Uh, but here's what some of the data show. Looking back at the NRMP applicant surveys, which are conducted every other year, uh, we can start to get a sense of the number of applications submitted relative to the number of interview offers. Uh, this data is unfortunately incomplete with admittedly, you know, imperfect response rates and response bias, but uh, from 2015 to 2019, the median number of applications submitted to interviews offered has actually remained fairly stable at around two to two and a half for U.S. seniors who ultimately match. Uh, can I get the next slide? For independent applicants, uh, which is a much more heterogeneous group, including, you know, USMD grads, reapplicants, osteopathic seniors, students at uh, international schools, et cetera, um, you know, understandably, that's a much larger group to, to nail down. But even in that group, the median number of applications submitted to interviews offered has also remained fairly stable uh, over the last several years uh, at around five to five and a half. I, I like to think, though, that for the average osteopathic senior in particular, that this number is likely better. Uh, I just don't have the direct data. I can say, however, that the percent of applicants who successfully match into EM has actually been steadily increasing uh, from about 76% in 2016 to 80% in 2020. Uh, and for the first time, luckily, DO seniors have been reported separately in the NRMP uh, match data reports. Uh, and in the 2020 match cycle, uh, they had a 79% match success rate overall compared to 89% for MD seniors, so not bad at all. Um, and so overall, I, I think this fits with the consensus statement that was released a few months ago that in general, students should be aiming to interview at about 12 programs with a max of 17. And I think these are reasonable numbers based on the data we have um, and hopefully uh, numbers that can alleviate some of the anxiety out there that really you don't need to apply to an excessive number of programs or go on uh, a million interviews. Thank you for that. Next slide, please. So before we talk about how competitive you are, let's talk about how competitive emergency medicine is in the first place. So this is a nice summary slide from the NRMP data that Mike Jazandi and Michelle Lin covered at the ALEM EM Match Advice, showing that there were about 256 ACGME approved EM residency programs at the 2020 match. And that means that there's 26, uh, 2,600 um, positions offered with only 2,652 filled. An important point here is that 64% of these positions were filled by LCME US seniors. Next slide. Again, here's another way of looking at it. There's about 3,600 total applicants with a majority of US grads. And again, the difference here is that this is looking at US grads versus LCME, which means the allopathic programs from US and Canada. Next slide. This slide highlights uh, available positions and the number of applicants. So as you can see, there's not enough positions for all of the applicants. Next slide. So really assessing your competitiveness depends on what you're competing for, right? So you need your advisors. I wanna emphasize this. You need your advisors to give you a sense of which programs are likely to be most highly competitive and most likely to be selective. After meeting with your advisor and your dean to read your MSPE, and you should, I highly encourage you to do that, and assessing your file, you should then know whether or not your application is average or above average. Next slide. 
This slide looks at some summary statistics regarding step scores, the number of research, advanced degrees, AOAs, and other characteristics uh, that another colleague here will cover in a bit. Again, this answers the question in the chat just a few minutes ago, which is if the interviews are just solely based on your USMLE score, and again, I want to emphasize it's not. Uh, when you look at holistic review, it really covers so many other aspects. The next slide. Thank you for that, Dr. Alvarez. So yeah, you know, there's more involved in just, you know, playing the numbers and having a lucky day uh, on the day that you took uh, step one. Um, you know, when you are thinking about what places you might select um, to uh, apply to, first of all, you know, you really do have to sit down and have kind of an on honest uh, introspection on the different things that make you competitive. Um, you may not have the best step score. That's okay. There are other things about you that helped you shine when you applied to medical school, and there are things about you that will help you shine now that you're applying for residency. But you have to be smart about it. So, you know, if you have some things that you have to overcome, know that and be honest with yourself. Think about your step scores. Think about your uh, performance on rotations. Um, you know, I know that the away rotations are not happening now, um, but your other rotation performance, what, um, if any, EM experiences, those kinds of rotations, how uh, you did there. Um, and then alternative life experiences. If you were in the military, if you had jobs, other degrees, um, these are all things that you can use to your advantage that um, can help you more than just a good step score. So... You know, beyond that, you um, want to be honest, you want to sell yourself uh, on the application as best you can. Um, when you talk about these experiences, put it out there, but don't put it all out there. So be smart about the things that you promote. If you are promoting uh, research that you've done, understand the research and don't oversell your role in it. Uh, we don't expect that everybody, you know, has done everything, but uh, be true to yourself and be honest. Uh, about the things that, that you bring. Uh, and I think that will help most everybody get to where they need to go. Um, and then being really smart about programs that you choose, thinking critically about what factors matter most to you. Um, there are um, rank lists out there. Um, Doximity, for example, has put together what they say are like the best residency programs in emergency medicine. I think we're quite unified in the, in the concept that there isn't a best program. Um, there's a best program for you. So what do you need to not just survive residency, but to thrive for three or four years? You know, thinking critically about cost of living uh, in terms of the salary that you're making. What are your insurance options? Can you um, support and provide for a family that you have? You know, do you care about things like parking or a food stipend? What about geography? If you have to surf, uh, is doing a residency in the Midwest the best choice for you? Um, you know, being really honest about your, your needs. And then uh, potentially uh, fellowship interests. You know, if, if you have an idea of, of what you want to do down the road, think about what programs might be more supportive of that or have more um, strength in that in terms of a residency. Um, and I think those are really the main points and, and I'll be around and very happy to answer questions in the chat as well. Thanks, Dr. Irish. Next slide, please. So the big question really is how many programs should you be applying to, right? And unfortunately, the answer is it depends. Here's the average number of programs from last year's cohorts. So you have an idea of how many people apply to. I want to emphasize the consensus guidelines for interviews. Historical data clearly demonstrate that greater than 95% of EM applicants, allopathic, osteopathic, and international medical graduates who interview at 12 programs will match. However, some leeway is needed to accommodate students participating in couples match. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Taku just uh, covered that in the chat. Uh, and so just keep that in mind. Next slide. By the way, just to give you perspective, here's the number of applicants that we see from the program's perspective. 
So we see a lot of applications as well. So, so keep that in mind as you're trying to be patient with us with responding to your emails and also like when you're gonna get uh, your interview list. By the way, November 2nd is uh, essentially around the, the, the time that you're gonna get uh, uh, answers from pro most programs in the country. Next slide. As Dr. Iris just mentioned, each one of you will be looking at residency programs differently. Some will be focusing on fit, some, some of you on the desired geographic location, number of vacation days, salary, some looking to resident morale and the call schedule. The point is each of you will have your own unique priorities. This slide highlights the different aspects of the programs that people considered last year along with their respective weights. So this is a good slide to, uh, to screenshot. And now I'm going to pass this uh, to the next team. So I'm Joel Mall. I'm the program director at VCU. And I'm Ava Pierce. I'm the associate chair of diversity and inclusion in the Department of Emergency Medicine at UT Southwestern in Dallas. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about kind of behind the curtain a little bit. Um, next slide. So this is a little bit from the program, how the program sees you. So you kind of understand how we are dealing with it from our side. Cause I think that helps to give some insight into some of the strategies that you may have in addition to what else is being said. So obviously for you all, um, the ARIS is already open, but the registration for the match, remember NRMP is a completely separate process. You have to register for the match if you want to match. This is not through ARIS. So it's important to understand that as well. Um, but the other key important date as we go through here is, you know, things have been pushed back. Normally we get access on September 15th to your applications. This year we don't get access to the 21st. Um, and some of the other things have been pushed back a little bit as well. So our rank order list is due much later than it normally would be by a couple of weeks. But match day itself has not moved, which means that March 15th, you will get notified whether you matched or not. And then there's a SOAP process, which is kind of beyond here as a part of a scramble, but not a not probably a good alternative for you. Um, and then March 19th is match day. Next slide. And I really wanna emphasize, so we can see your applications for the first time on October 21st. So if at all possible within your ability, you really wanna get that as complete as possible because that's really gonna help you to have the best chance as we start to go through applications and not putting your application aside because half the things are missing. Um, and some of the things, you know, clearly are beyond your control, perhaps if you had a late slow or late rotation, and we understand that, but, you know, some things are not necessarily beyond your control. And so you want to make sure you attend to that so that when you open up to us and we can see you, that we're seeing you in your a good first impression. Next slide. So how do you get attention? How do you get our attention to make that first impression? You want to have some way to stand out for the crowd. So... Uh, Dr. Elrose talked about how, you know, there's eight to 900 applications per program and some programs get a lot more. And it really depends on how many spots they have as well to get a sense of that ratio. Because uh, you have 2000 applications and four spots is, well, I guess in emergency medicine, six is the minimum, but it's going to be one of those things where it affects the competitiveness, but also that can be changed based on the fact that some programs are more friendly to certain types of applicants. Um, so it, it's not to worry about, except that you want to make sure you try to stand out for positive reasons from the crowd. Next slide. Likewise, there are some of you that are going to have some red flags, you know, that maybe have had some academic difficulties. Hopefully none of you have had professionalism issues, but maybe you have. Um, you have to disclose if you have a misdemeanor or felony or if you've taken a leave of absence from your training or gaps in your training. So it's really important to be able to address those things. Um, not over address them, but address them. You don't want to use an entire personal statement to talk about, you know, a misdemeanor, you know, that you, you know, were carrying alcohol at the age of 18, um, or we're going to probably think that, why are they so accommodating for that, you know? So, you know, I always want to make sure to put this obviously in a very positive light, that this was a learning experience, a growth experience. You don't want to blame anyone, um, whether they truly are a blame or not, I guess is something you can decide for yourself, but you really want to put it in, a, in the best light you can. Because um, that's going to be really important to help you overcome any potential red flags. Next. 
So just a real quick overview, you know, as we quickly go through and look at application, we kind of go through these check boxes, you know, one of them can be your demographics. So it's important to understand that that's going to help us maybe understand you a little bit where you came from, where you may have ties to places like that. And so if that's not so obvious, then sometimes, you know, reaching out will be something we'll talk about in a second that may help you. Your medical school stuff, obviously make sure you have your awards, you know, both in medical school and activities related to medical school. That's gonna be something that's gonna be helpful, professional societies, things like that. Um, grades are gonna be likely much more important in the clinical years to most people in emergency medicine in your preclinical grades. And a lot of people who go into emergency medicine tend to do a lot better in your clinical years. Um, experience, again, we wanna to get to know you as a person a little bit. So you wanna list things that reflect upon you, your work experience, your volunteer experience, your research or scholarship experience. Those things can help us to get to know you a little bit better. Um, you shouldn't try to you know, make as many lines as you can. If you have that many, that's great. But on the flip side is it's not a competition to see how much you can put there. You really wanna put things that are important and reflect upon you. Um, exam scores, we talked a little bit about USMLE and COMLEX. Um, you know, again, you know, some people are a little bit more familiar with COMLEX than others. So some people will probably advise you to take a USMLE if you're an osteopathic student. Um, and that can depend on the program. We do not require that at VCU, for example, but there are some programs I want to kind of compare apples to apples. And eventually that's going to go away. But for now, that's something you have to kind of deal with. Again, personal statement have multiple people read it. Uh, that's the best advice I can give you. And hopefully you've heard that from others, both medical and non-medical people, because a lot of the times it doesn't make a lot of difference. A lot of them are very similar, quite frankly, but every once in a while you get one that really you know, makes you excited to meet somebody. And really once in a while you get one that's really makes you excited not to meet somebody. So it's really important to have that in mind. Um, and we'll check for typos, spell check, things like that is really important. And then finally, we touched on slows and the fact that the standard letter of evaluation, you know, the consensus statement is one, you know, from an acting internship, hopefully it's your own institution or if you're an orphan institution to be able to rotate there. Um, you're going to have these O slows and faculty slows and just general letters of recommendation. From emergency medicine, we kind of want to get the, the general slow, but for other people, I want to get to know you, especially when we don't have the opportunity to get to know you in person over this kind of Zoom format. It's a new world. We want to really make sure that we know what characteristics about your personality. I don't need an internist to tell me you'll be a great emergency physician. I need to tell me about your work habits, about your character, about your personality, and, and things that we would want to have you in the program for. Next slide. So I'd like to discuss a few general principles of holistic review. A key element is with holistic review, it's really widening the lens through which we review applicants and really valuing the different dimensions that each person has. Next slide. So in a holistic review, we really look at generalized individual consideration of each person. And these selection criteria are linked to institutional and program missions and goals. And then they promote, promote diversity and inclusion as essential to excellence. So when I review applicants, it's a balanced approach. I look at your experiences, your attributes, your competencies, and your academic metrics. So when we look at experiences, we look at the path you've taken to get where you are and the context in which that happened, including your personal level experiences like your research, working with underserved patient populations, your leadership roles, and your community service. And we also look at your population level experiences including your regional, national, and rural context in which your experiences have taken place. We'll look at your attributes, cultural humility, proficiency in other languages, your ability to be a team player. We also consider your competencies, the ways in which you apply your knowledge, skills, and abilities. And we look at those metrics that we've discussed. Next slide. So some other important considerations that we look at are goal humanism, AOA, awards, your research publications, your research presentations, and Sigma Sigma Phi. Next slide. Really just widens the lens through which applicants are viewed and it further leverages the benefits of diversity and inclusion. All right, uh, so communication, uh, basically key thing is don't stalk the PD. Uh, you know, we find that a little creepy uh, at times. Um, you know, you want to communicate and you want to communicate, you know, your passion for the program and things like that, but you just want to make sure that you're not, you know, emailing somebody every day because that's obviously going to turn people up. And so just use some reason with that. And you can, remember, you can contact other people. You can contact a program director or APDs, program coordinators, uh, chief residents, things like that, that are great resources for just basic information if you have just a simple question, um, especially if you've been emailing the PDR. 
Um, but understand that, you know, what you may email to anybody could easily be forwarded or shared. Um, so you want to make sure that you always are respectful in your interactions with that, because, you know, if you're mean to my program coordinator, you know, that's going to be a, a huge red flag and probably an exclusion, quite frankly, as an example. Um, you know, we don't always get significant updates from errors. In fact, most of the time we don't. So if you didn't have your step scores and suddenly they came through November 1st, and you're really interested in us, you know, sometimes it's worth a quick email to say, hey, just to let you know, these things have been out of significance in my application. Because although we will go back and look at them, if I've already looked at your application, it's probably in the bottom of the pile to go back, quite frankly. Um, and then finally, you know, every year people talk about whether you should do a letter of intent, you know, I'm going to rank you number one or what have you. And I think the important thing with that is EM is a small world. So if you're going to disclose, which is completely voluntary, um, to people, you know, hey, I'm going to rank you number one, you're my top choice, what have you, just make sure that you in intend that. If you send five different letters saying I'm ranking you number one and every single program ranks you number one, there's probably four programs that are kind of mad at you at the moment uh, for just not being honest. Now, do we believe that? Not necessarily, uh, but it's one of those things where you just want to make sure that you're playing professional in, in the field. Okay, so we're gonna, so once again, my name is Harsha Suley. I'm the residency program director at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in Newark. And Taku, you wanna introduce yourself? Um, I'm Taku Tyra from LA County, USC. Um, I was in the residency office at three different hospitals uh, over nine years. Great. So what we wanna to talk to you a little bit about is your strategy in terms of when you looked at, when you think about all the different things that people have pointed out so far, step scores, other things as well, where does that leave you? Some of that conversation started happening in the chat already as well. But the way I like to think about this is kind of separating it out into two key factors as you're assessing programs initially. Again, we're not talking about making a rank list right now. That's going to be a separate session for later as well. But right now we're talking about where do you even apply to? So when you're looking at this, what I like to do is think about kind of my personal factors and then what I would call structural factors, if you might, for um, residency programs. Personal factors are very key for sure. So things that matter, geography, support systems, family, those kinds of things make a big difference. Um, one of the things I'm on the East Coast now, I'm not from the East Coast, but I was fascinated to read in the New York Times a few years ago, there was a survey done about how far from their mothers people live. And the closest people live to their mothers is in the New York City area, apparently. But those factors make a difference. So do I expect to get a lot of um, applicants from my area? Yes, am I looking for that commitment to the geographic area? Absolutely, to some extent but that's not the only thing we're looking for from a program standpoint. And so you shouldn't focus just on that as well, but those are things that lend you some amount of comfort as well. Other things that make a difference are diversity. Um, it's a big factor. If you're looking for the social mission of a hospital, those are factors that you need to prioritize before you go into this to figure out what matters to you the most as well. And then don't forget about simple things like mentorship. People focus very much on, you know, we talked, Amanda talked about the proximity rankings already and how those are not really reliable in any sense of it, you, what you want to think about is what's the program that's going to be the right fit for you. And when you're thinking about that, think beyond just the clinical, just the academic as well. Think about mentorship as well, because a lot of what happens with our careers later on depends on the faculty that mentor us, talk to us, teach us as well, and they influence us tremendously in terms of our future career paths. So you want to look at the faculty group, the resident group, and see are these people that I can relate to? Are these people I can see myself communicating with? Absolutely, it's gonna be different because you're not gonna be interacting with them physically on the interview trail, but those are all factors that beforehand you can look at websites and get some of that information as well. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Taku to talk a little bit about some of the key things that he prioritizes when looking at it from this. Yeah, I think that I've been on both sides of being uh, the selector and uh, helping the students uh, come up with their list. So I think I have both perspectives. And, you know, over many years, I think that uh, I've seen very few kind of people really s screw this up. And w the way they can really mess this up is to not have a mix of uh, programs. And when I say a mix of programs, real mix of competitive in the very most broad sense of the word, really goes, you know, you have a very, if you, where I remember a student that was so, super talented didn't match because she interviewed, okay, at 10 programs, but that they were all the most high powered institutions. And she didn't, and she actually didn't even interview at her own place, which was actually not a high powered institution. So I think that it, um, you want to have sort of a mix and you need to have a kind of like, you know, when you're 
applying to college, you want your reaches, your reasonables, and then your sort of, um, uh, I can't remember what the term is. Um, Unfortunately, there's not sort of a magical sort of uh, a hidden list out there about how safety. Thank you. It goes, there's no uh, magical uh, list. It goes, nobody's going to be like, you know, Adam's not going to go, oh, yeah, well, you should consider me a safety school. And Dr. Alvarez isn't going to be like, oh, it goes, oh, I'm a safety school too, so you should apply. It goes, nobody's going to say that. So I think that that comes to the second question, uh, the, um, you know, idea is that be careful who you listen to. Um, there is a real temptation to listen to the person who went through it the most recently goes, oh, and they'll tell you, goes, oh, I got into Stanford because, you know, I had this great suit on. It goes, uh, they might have hated that suit and you might have got in be despite of that suit. So, you know, the real reality is that nobody knows why they got into it. it goes, Dr. Alvarez, your suit is great. He goes, don't worry. Uh, we're not talking about you. Um, but really the best people to listen to more than anybody, more than your dean, more than your clerkship director, is somebody who has actually done selection because uh, they actually know how they do it, not just how they think it is done. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's currently doing, but as someone who has some experience with that. And you know, we're trying to give you a little bit of a sneak behind the curtain there. Um, you know, one of my uh, colleagues makes a point that think about how, how long you spent studying for step one why wouldn't you prepare for your rank list and your in, prepare for your interview as well with the same sort of fervor? It's a much higher, it's a higher sort of uh, stakes decision. A, take the same approach and really try to find out as much as possible. There is a lot of research because I can't count how many times I've been asked a question that is just all over our website, all over our this or that and this and that. So I think that it's, um, you know, that that is sort of like, that information's out there, take a use of it. And I think that along the line, I guess that goes, we'll get to this, like I'll, I'll leave the last one for the day, but um, reflecting kind of what Dr. Irish was saying before, be careful being enamored by a program, enamored by the name, name. I think that, you know, I see it a lot in our applicants. We have a very big name in that we're a cool place to come to. But I think that we're a very sort of specific and particular one that is that we were very much, you know, focused on the care for the underserved. And that's, you know, we want people who care about that. And in, you know, to answer some of these questions that are coming out is that, you know, we've had, you know, we've had multiple people who have matched who have failed step one. It goes, I remember from a couple of years ago, it goes, you know, we had three of our greatest applicants were had a two or three, a two twelve, and a two seventeen. So I think that it's, but they were very exceptional in other ways. So I think that I wanted to echo what Dr. Wood Pierce was saying, which is that we think about you in the whole context, and we think about it's not just the numbers. The numbers are kind of there; uh, those are sort of like the you know, the floor. But really, we look at because we also have things that we value. And you have things that you value as well. So Harsh, do you wanna? Right. Yeah, so you know, one of the things as we were prepping for this session as well, a lot of what we did was just brainstorming things that we consider challenging in many ways as well. So one of the challenges several of you are gonna face is once you are ready with your application list as well, you're gonna go out there, you're gonna put out all these applications and in your mind you're thinking, is this my best list right now? Dr. Mull talked about the fact that, you know, we don't get ERAS updates constantly. So if you have just decided to apply to a program December 15th, we don't get a flag in our ERAS saying, hey, look, someone new applied to you. So how do you assess which is your perfect application list or your optimal application list? Should you try to work on that right at the beginning? And what if you don't get interviews? How do you cope with that rejection as well? So Taco, I don't know if you have thoughts on, you know, how to cope with that rejection aspect and how to prepare for that in a sense. Yeah, I, you know, Harsh and I had a great uh, conversation the other day. And, you know, I was, when we're talking about, it, I was thinking about this book called uh, Rejection Proof. And it's by this guy, Jia Zhang, who did a hundred days of uh, rejection. And basically he just tried to be rejected about something uh, every day for a hundred days and made a vlog about it. And what he quickly realized is that we're so afraid of rejection because we think that we're being rejected. In reality, what's being rejected is that what you have to offer does not match what you what the other person wants. So it's a mismatch, and I think that's a much better way of thinking about it. And it has much better, you know. And I think it's called a match for a reason. Is that we're trying to match our abilities 
you know, I think that at our place, we've had many, many applicants where I've come through and I've said, that's a really, that person's going to do great things somewhere else, right? We're really aware of what we're good at and what we're not good at. And we would never, well, hopefully, you know, we wouldn't be selfish and take somebody who would just bring glory to us, but we couldn't really help to, uh, you know, to, you know, nurture. Yep. Absolutely. And I think as you think about this application list as well, in some ways, this application season has been transformed because you have sessions like these, which were really not available even as, 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 as last year for that matter. And so the amount of information that you have access to is overwhelming in some ways. So part of the challenge for you now is going to be how do you sift through that as well? I'm sure you're getting notifications for Q&A sessions that places are hosting, virtual residency fairs, come have a virtual dinner with our residents, whatever else. None of these things happen for the most part in advance. Usually you had your audition rotations, your ways, and that was pretty much it. And so you have to consider this from the other standpoint, which is that programs are marketing themselves as well. We've all ramped up our game in terms of marketing. And so how much do you get swayed by that marketing as well? Just because you see a flashy session somewhere or a cool Instagram account or Twitter postings, whatever else, how much do those things matter as opposed to the core of what that program is going to do for you? Because a program is not made by social media. And so I'm curious, Taku, if you have thoughts on kind of the social media and the influences on your application list as well. Um, uh, I'm going to skip that question because I was going to come up with the response to what you said a second ago. Is that it, um, there's a lot of things that students ask that I think are irrelevant or should be irrelevant to how, how you pick. You know, I think that it, um, how many, oh, this place got 105 intubations average versus 40. I'm sorry, in the real world, 40 and 100, it's not going to make a big, if some place averages two, okay, that's a big deal. But I think that uh, that would be a place that would have trouble actually maintaining their accreditation. So, um, I, a harsh, it goes in response to the question you actually asked, not the one that I wanted to answer, is that uh, I, I, I really don't have an answer. I think that it, um, you know, I too, as you can tell, am swayed by shiny things. Um, and I, I subscribe to everybody's uh, Instagram because I'm like, oh, look at that. That's so cool. But it's, oh gosh, you know, it's so hard to, you know, to not be swayed by that, you know. Absolutely. And so as we wrap up kind of our portion, you know, key things to think about are, yes, pay attention to strategy with regard to step scores. In the chat, there's been some stuff about, you know, step one score, step two scores, but really be introspective about yourself. That's really the biggest thing you can do as you make this application list, because unless you have a good sense of who you are as a candidate and as a person and what's important to you, your list is not going to be the right fit, if you might as well. And so yeah, I'm going to end I, my part and hand it over to Taku to wrap up. Sorry, because I just, it's a, that's a great point. I think that I wanted to just reiterate what Dr. Iris said earlier is that um, don't pander, don't pander to what we what you think we want to hear. We want to know who you are. Um, you know, if you know if being a surfer is really important to you, I think that that there I've, there've been many situations where that's actually worked in somebody's favor. And I think that it um you want to the worst. I, I tell students that the worst thing that can actually happen is not that you don't match, is that you match at a place where you can't be yourself. You know, I had a student who, um, you know, who was gay and he had a lot of circumstances around that that made his application not as strong. But I said, he goes, you know, and he was worried about putting that out in his application. And I really encouraged him because the worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you're just going to be somewhere where you're not going to be accepted, you know, for that. And I think that it, I can't imagine what it'd be like to then another three years to, you know, suppress something just so, you know, you know, singular to what you, who you know, who you are. Absolutely. And so with that, we're going to hand it next to our next team, which is Dr. Tyra and Dr. Irish. All right. Happy to be back. Thank you. Um, so just some notes on resources. So as uh, has been mentioned previously, I want to reiterate, you know, kind of how you start this process. I'm sure you have some ideas already about places that you've heard about that sound good, um, that seem kind of attractive for various different reasons. Um, but I think a good place to start is to talk to some of your advisors, people that you are 
close to, um, you know, especially uh, EM physicians that hopefully you've had a chance to work with that get you and that you um, mesh with in some fashion. Um, ask them, you know, what do you think of this place? Or do you have ideas about programs that you think that, you know, my particular package of skills and experiences would be attractive to? Um, thinking additionally about places where graduates of your medical school have matched and have done well, have um, enjoyed themselves and recommend, um, certainly reaching out to some of your alumni. Um, and then, you know, again, looking critically about what are your skills. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, you know, I have some significant political involvement. Is that something I should include? Well, if it's important to you, then yeah, I think you should include it. And I think you should be aware of programs that may um, be really into that and that there will be programs that are not so into that. And again, this sort of boils down to not surviving residency, but thriving. So what is the place that is gonna accept you for you know, the, the lump of clay uh, that you're gonna be this fantastic, beautiful statue capable of rocking an ET tube at the end of three or four years, you know, you need to be the right kind of clay for that program. Um, and it's not just for them to mold you, you wanna have an impact on that program too. So again, the match is a match and it's your opportunity to choose. Uh, you have a, a better position here than you did in medical school and you can really exercise your uh, ability to make that choice as you select these programs and as you ultimately make your rank list. Now, moving on from there onto the resources. So there's a number of different resources uh, that you can use and I think they all have a different place. Uh, again, caveat being this is how I did things and some things may have changed in the past couple of years. But I think first of all, the SAEM residency directory is a great place to start just figuring out where programs are, what programs are um, available to you, you know, whether it is uh, by geographic location, um, you know, figuring out if, if there's a better place to apply, um, you know, in the Midwest or, or the East Coast, et cetera. From there, I think the AMRA match is a nice place to further uh, clarify which programs might be more open to uh, international medical graduates or DO students. Um, not all schools are going to be as accepting. Again, caveat being, these are not up to date by the minute. So, you know, you may need to do a little bit more research. But if you know that this program does not take DO grads, it might not be worth, you know, spending a lot of time applying. Um, certainly put it on your list if you want, but I wouldn't only apply to programs that don't accept DOs if you're a DO. It just doesn't make sense. It's not the best use of your time. Additionally, board score cutoffs. There are programs that will cut off. Again, you're welcome to apply to them. It might not be the best use of your uh, resources uh, in terms of you know, how much money you're going to throw at this problem. And then from there, I think uh, Frida is really nice, helps you kind of dig into the stats. There's some supplementary information uh, programs will provide. Uh, you may not be able to find all of that on their websites, but just to get a little bit more detail. Um, additionally, the Texas Star resource, um, it, when I used it, it had some good pieces in it. Some of it, I think, um, you know, you would need to take with a grain of salt. Um, it could be somewhat anxiety inducing. There's some uh, unverified accuracy. Um, I sort of think of it as like the SDN of resources. And while I'm at it, I'll talk about SDN. I think um, most people who've reached this point uh, in the application process have spent quite a bit of time on SDN and have figured out whether or not it's a place that works for them. I think for me, it was uh, very anxiety inducing and downright toxic at times. And for my mental health, I'm never going back to that website again. Uh, but if it works for you, by all means, uh, but just know that there are a lot of people that are inflating um, their application and their stats. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the best resources that carried me through the entire application cycle was the EM Google spreadsheet. I don't know if someone has made that again this year, but I know they did last year and I know they did two years ago and it is an absolute all-star resource. It gives you the inside scoop 
of what people think about the programs, um, what they think about the interviews. Um, uh, let's see, what else? The different scores, the different um, kind of application uh, pros and cons that individuals themselves uh, who are applying to those programs bring to the table. Again, they might be lying through their teeth, but I found uh, it seemed pretty legit. Uh, so it was a great place for me to figure out, you know, hey, I haven't heard from that program. Oh yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people with my stats also not hearing back from this program. So I'm happy to answer any more questions. I'll turn it back over to Taku. Yeah, I think the other, um, the other references that we don't, uh, we don't recommend would be the doximity. Um, the doximity sort of uh, index for emergency medicine programs because it's very much uh, based off of reputation and not off of any sort of, um, you know, and I think that just having a name that is out there a lot is really kind of, it's just how famous you are and not anything about how great it is. Or um, I think that the other, the other way that the, um, the other way that the these resources are actually very helpful is that for some reason you specifically want to train at a four year program or or if you specifically want to train at a county program it's you can actually just it's easy to find all of them and I think that that would be the other way that you can use that the other one is that if you are couples matching and I'll just say I couples match and it's much mathematically it's much easier if you can go to places where there are uh, lots of hospitals in close proximity. So that's the other way that you can sort of um, use that uh, resource. Um, I would just, because there's a stuff about location, I would just, he goes, you know, being in California, he goes, you know, we get a lot of emails. He goes, oh, I really like California and I really want to come there because of California. He goes, we pretty much ignore those and probably it works against you. Um, if you. If there's a place that you really want to go to and it is, uh, not naturally where you would, uh, looking at your application where you would, somebody would think you would go to, you know, you're from, you know, you're from California and you want to go to uh, Indiana or something like that, but because you have a family member there, you know, that would be the one situation where I would, uh, I would separate from what Joel was saying earlier is that you, that's where you can say, hey, I just want to let you know that I have a strong interest in there because I have finally it there and I you know, want to be able to have that sort of um, support uh, in that situation. So I think that that's a place where I would actually, one of the circumstances where I would just separate from that. Harsh, back to you. Great, okay. So with that, everyone, thank you for being part of this. What we're gonna do is open it up to a little Q and A. Um, Dr. Alvarez is going to moderate this based on questions that were in the chat as well as um, questions that he's kind of garnered through this whole process. Over to you, Dr. Alvarez. Yeah. Um, again, feel free to ask more questions in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to bring up a, a question that was asked earlier about step two. Uh, what are your thoughts about step two? Uh, should people take it? Um, when should they take it? Um, I'll, I'll take that. Go ahead. I think that it, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to repeat what Dr. Pierce said is that they look at the application in the context of the whole thing. So if you're a horrible human being and you rock step one and step two, nobody's going to want you, right? If you're an amazing human being and, you know, you walk on water, you cure lepers, then he goes, everyone's going to want you regardless of what your step one is. So I think that it's in context. If it's, it's rarer than an application, the make or break is that single number. Granted, if, you know, if possible, it's probably better to have it done. I think that it, um, cause there are some people who I've had a situation where I knew somebody who didn't match I uh, so who matched into a program and then failed step two and failed to be able to start their school, their uh, residency in time. So I think that that's where you get into some, that's the real exception. I goes, there aren't a lot of people that are waiting till February, March. Uh, I hope you're not doing that, but that would be the one uh, caveat to that. Any other thoughts? I think for me, uh, if, if you get a 240, for instance, which is a good number uh, or 220, and you don't take your step two until February or March. I think that's fine. 
I, I do think that if you get like, what if you get a 220 and then you take it again and you get a 200, I think that would look bad. Uh, and so I would definitely w uh, recommend for those uh, to, to hold off. And, and if you're going to take it, you better study because just because you did well on your first step doesn't mean you're guaranteed to do better on your second uh, step. And if you don't do well, then it definitely will count against you. Um, I think it's also important to understand your medical school. Some medical school will require you to take it by a certain time. And so none of our advice here would matter if they tell you that you have to take it by October. Um, I know that it's definitely required to graduate. And so you want to make sure that you take it uh, with enough time to, to be able to, to get it before your graduation, especially since we're worried about all these cancellations due to COVID. I think that's another thing to, to keep in mind. Yeah, I would just add to that. I do know some program directors who have told me they don't rank people without a step two score. And I mean, that's not our policy, but you can understand because of the concern of starting. So yeah, and you can get this information uh, either at uh, Emra Match or that link uh, that SAM has also created. Um, the next question is, somebody brought up like, what if I have a political view or, if I, or I want to share something that may be controversial? What are your thoughts about that? Um, Harsh, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so, you know, that's a tough question because in general, I would say you're better off leaving obvious politics out of it. Um, and by obvious politics, I mean, you know, we're in an election season right now, so I'll be blunt about it in terms of, you know, party lines, who you're going to vote for, things like that. However, you know, we're a program, selfishly, we're based in Newark. We have a significant social mission, and a lot of other programs around the country do. Um, we're a public county hospital. So if someone comes to me and starts talking about racial injustice and things like that as issues go, we would absolutely be open to that, I think. But I think clear political talk gets to be a little bit more challenging because as much as we are in Newark with a social mission, all of these things, you might think that all of us are, you know, left of left, but that's not the case. I can assure you we have a very diverse uh, faculty group from a political standpoint, on the other hand, as well. So I would be careful about political stuff, but social things, things that convey your passion, I think. Um, I think Dr. Kellogg put in the chat there as well, you know, we want to know who you are but temperate in some ways as well. Any other thoughts about that? All right, I, any I, more I, questions? I, oh, I, go ahead, I, talk. I will, I will throw out there from uh, EOAC, it goes equal, equal employment and opportunity. Uh, well, I can't, I don't know what it stands for. Um, it's political leanings is actually not legal to, uh, to uh, make a determination on. So. Um, I'll, I will just also throw that out there. So you can, you can mention it, but it, it, we may not rank you based on your political views, but how you handle that argument, you can be so passionate that you could just be annoying. Um, and I guarantee you definitely, we will not rank you if you're, if you're that annoying person. I just wanted to jump in and say something I neglected to say earlier about um, especially the EM spreadsheet. Thank you, someone, for including that because now I'm going to read the heck out of it <laughs> for our applicants. But truly, um, when you post stuff, you're, you're listing like your name and your background and your experiences. At the very least, put a username on there that does not identify you. A lot of my usernames have the word Irish in them. I made sure not to do that here. Like, don't be traceable, um, but be a, be a pal and list accurate information. Help your friends out. We're all in this yeah. together. All right. For me, I think my, my perspective on this is that if you're going to say something bad, um, you're going to harm other people because unless it's, it's general, generalizable um, and it's not just your opinion, then your opinion should not really be inputted there if it's going to just make other people look bad, right? Like I, I believe in karma. I believe that uh, if I spew a lot of negative things out there, it's going to come back on me because I would look at things negatively um, and it, it may come off and when I talk to the, the program or other um, applicants and somehow those come back. I, I know this isn't the, kind of the, the, the main thrust of the talk, but I think that that's also true in the interview. I think that it, um, uh, here is the absolute never talk badly of another program ever will be in, in a, you know, you can say goes, oh, I, you know, I rotated at uh, Newark and at LA County and goes, and these are the things I liked about LA County. These are things about say I liked about Newark. That's totally okay to say, but you know, oh, at Newark, they didn't care about us. And you know, it goes, 
Um, I had somebody do that once to talk badly about the program where I came from, where it goes, I was at Stony Brook and the student had rotated at Bellevue. I'm like, oh, what'd you think of it? He goes, well, I wasn't trying to bait him or anything. He goes, he goes, and he just started talking doo-doo about it. And finally I, I stopped him because I, I, I'm going to just stop you because I just, so you know, uh, that's where I trained. So I think that that's, I mean, that's an extreme example, but many people have done really silly things like that. Yeah, I just want to echo that because when you think emergency medicine, even though it seems like it's a big emergency medicine world, it's a small family, I say. Most of the program directors, clerkship directors, we all know one another. So we talked about sending those letters of intent. You know, if you send that letter to Dr. Mole and say, I really want to go to your program, and you send that letter also to our program, and we happen to be talking, you know, we really want to only see that go to one person. So just know emergency medicine is a, a small family. Yeah, and we will remember, right? Because it may oh, yeah. not be for residency. It could be for fellowship. It could be for job. Uh, I think that uh, if you truly love the program and you tell them that you're number one and they rank you number one and then you end up somewhere else, they will know. They will remember that. Well, and along the lines of like throwing shade at another program, I mean, you know, we want people who are going to be positive because that's who you want to work with, right? People who are yeah. positive. So, you know, this is a job interview and you want people who are going to be positive and not problems. And so if you come off with a lot of negativity, you're not going to impress any of us. Yeah, I would, throw that, I would also add on to there is that it, um, the other example is just be careful what you say in generally in social media. I think that it's also don't, you know, speak so negatively. I mean, I was at a coffee shop at, in San Diego during ASAP and I overheard these three students very loudly speaking very badly about a program that my friend was a program director at. And um, I also might have figured out who they were. And, but either way, I told them specifically, you guys should be very careful about what you say in such a loud setting. Because, so. so in the interest of time, I think we're, we're uh, finishing up here. Uh, maybe I'll ask each of you to to give your final thoughts. Um, I'll ask Dr. Kellogg first. I just put my final thoughts into the ah. chat. Someone threw out the wonderful uh, question about what is the actual number you should be applying to. This is a really hard question because everything's a little bit different this year because it's going to, you know, the expenses are different. You don't have to budget for travel. So as program folks, we are expecting more applications because folks have more money to spend on clicking the ERAS button. We're really hoping that doesn't happen because we still just want to, we want to hear from the people who actually want to come here, not from folks who say I can apply to 20 more. So I'm just going to do it even though I'm not interested. Um, in terms of the numbers, it's really hard to know what the right number is. We do know that people have been chronically over applying for a long time um, and that almost every applicant doesn't need 50 plus programs and is canceling interviews by the time you get into late December and January and has wasted a whole bunch of money on ERAS and even gone on some interviews that they regret going on early that they were just going because it was offered early. Um, I always tell folks somewhere around 25 programs that you really thought about that actually fit you, that made sense, where you really did the homework and thought about this is, this is a place that makes sense for me to go there. This fits what I'm looking to do. I'm going to make sense to them as an applicant. Um, you know, if you have low step scores, there are places that say we do a holistic review and don't care. And any program you want to fire at a place that insists on everybody having a 250 or better, then you're allowed to do that, but it doesn't count in your core 25 or so programs. That number goes up if you have red flags, like Joe mentioned. In your in your application that number goes up if you're in a couples match but as a foundational number somewhere around that is probably what i think is what you really need um, and then if you want to go beyond that that's up to you perfect thank you uh dr lewis yeah well first of all i just um you know want to thank everybody for coming this was a lot of fun and you know just by being here on this uh, you know, in this meeting it tells me that all of you are way ahead of the game. And, and I think it's just so important to remember that, you know, everything is going to be okay in the end of this. And we constantly have students that are just so anxious needlessly. I mean, if you ask all of us, do you really need to be that anxious? No, none of us think that you do. Everybody's going to be okay. Um, and yes, this is a weird year, but that also means that you all are trailblazers. And we're going to be coming to you next year to tell us how in the world you did it because, you know, we, we may find ourselves in, you know, virtual 
um, interviews for, for years to come. Hopefully not, but you know, we may. <laughs> so in, in any case, uh, you know, despite all the numbers, all of the, uh, the stats, all of, all of everything that we've said, everybody, I just want you to just take a deep breath, relax, um, focus on what you can highlight in your applications, of course, but just know that everything's going to turn out okay. That's, that's really all I can say. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Moll? Yeah, I would just echo that. I, I think, you know, interviews is an opportunity for you to really enjoy the process. And I know that sounds really weird and you probably you're like, yeah, you're on the other side. I get that. But on the flip side, enjoy the process, show your true self, be yourself. Because again, you're going to go someplace for three or four years. And I don't know, for some reason, my dog keeps flipping up here. So anyway, <laughs> That's Devo. He's much better looking than me. Um, but anyway, long and short of it, you want to make sure that you are truly being yourself. You want to enjoy the process, embrace it, you know, try to get away the anxiety because that's going to show the best you. And quite frankly, it's going to be the best match, which is what this is all about. Perfect. Dr. Irish. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I just want to reiterate the, the same things that everybody said, but um, and points that I've tried to make in the chat as well. This is your opportunity to be very selective and find the best program for you. Um, I did not match at my number one and I am so thankful for that because I have found the perfect family for me. I love the program. I love the training. I can be myself. Uh, you know, the things that I need to um, thrive and get through the long shifts are absolutely there for me. So you want to find that for you as well. I did not have perfect scores. My uh, rotations were not amazing, but I found a way to sell myself. I got the right number of applications. So I really believe you guys can do it too. Um, I hope that these sessions can help you do that. If there are any questions, please reach out. Thanks. Yep. Dr. Tyra? Um. I think that I too would like to echo. I just wanted to say that I agree. I think Adam and I were both smiling when uh, Joel said that um, it's a great time. Um, I learned so much about myself and I learned the interview process was um, learning so much about what actually mattered to me. And I think that it was a very, it was a very a time of great growth. And I think that it um very career affirming to meet the other people that were on the interview trail. Um, I think that I would also just put out there, those of you who have sort of your, you know, your marginal applications. I had one of my advisees last year fail step one twice uh, and matched. So don't think that it, um, it goes, there are not that many med students that do that, but I also know many students who have done that and have matched. So I think that it, um, don't, there has always, no matter what your situation, there has been somebody else who has gone through that. Perfect. Uh, you know, positively. Gone. <laughs> Dr. Pierce. So I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I, um, when I look at how I advise students, I want to tell them that you know, matter, no matter where you train, you will become a good emergency medicine physician. You just want to take this time in the interview process to find the place that you feel like is really your home that you're gonna be happiest over those three years. We're gonna find the mentors to help you pursue the next phase of your career, be it fellowship, um, academic or community medicine. So just enjoy that time on the interview trail and really listen to your advisors is the next thing. We've given you some great general pearls, but you know, if you're couples matching or if you know, you're thinking about going to different areas of the country, that advisor is gonna be the person that knows you the best. They're gonna be the person that helps you know exactly how many programs you need to apply to, because it's a range depending on multiple factors. So just really pay close attention to advisors. Yep. And I'm just going to, uh, before I, I leave it for uh, Dr. Shuley, who's uh, the, the chair of this meeting, uh, for me, 12. 12 is the number, right? 12 interview is the goal. Um, beyond that, really, I think everything else will be fine. So aim for 12. Once you get your 12, you're like, okay, done. Like you can exhale and relax and understand that uh, the odds are with you that you're going to match this year. And uh, with that, Dr. Suley. Great. And I think my two cents would be to just be as introspective as possible. I think to me, all of life is about knowing yourself first, because before you can interact with others, know others, you have to know yourself. 
And this is one of those perfect places. If you know yourself well enough, not just from a competitiveness standpoint, but as Dr. Pierce said as well, about all those other factors that go into it as well, what's going to make you happy, that what's going to keep you at peace with yourself, if you might, those are things that matter, including your politics, perhaps, depending on where you want to be physically, all of those things, keep those within perhaps, but um, all of those things make a big difference. So introspection is the thing that I would take away the most is, you know, focus on that. With that, we're going to end this panel. Um, I would really like to thank all of our panelists. They have done a truly amazing job in putting this together for all of you. And to all of you who are here as students, we look forward to seeing you virtually for this year, but hopefully physically in the next year as well. And um, welcome to the emergency medicine community. Thank you all. Bye.